So when an expression is actually written like this underneath a radical, we have a radical expression, pretty straightforward. And the thing underneath the radical, the number or the quantity on the inside, that thing is called the radicand. So whatever lives underneath the radical has that name radicand. So we're going to look at a few of these radical expressions and just pick out what the radicand is of each of them. So for the first, what value or what expression do we have underneath that radical symbol? 105. So my radicand in that case is 105. We need to know that term. For part B, what is my radicand in that case? Simply just x, because 2 isn't grouped inside of that radical symbol. He's hanging on the outside. But then for part C, in this case, 2 is included underneath the radical. So that entire radicand is x plus 2, that whole entire expression under there. So we need to know that term. And some other pieces. So the square of any non-zero number is always what? So let's think about that. If I take a positive number and I square it, what kind of number do I get out? A positive. The only other option that I have is a negative. If I take a negative number and square it, what kind of a number, what kind of result do I get out? Negative times a negative gives me a positive. So whenever I'm squaring a non-zero number, what comes out? It's always going to be positive. I can't square a number and get a negative out. It just doesn't work that way. So for example, if we look at the square root of negative 100, is there a number that when I multiply it times itself, I get out negative 100. So let's just try. I would think naturally to try negative 10. Since the square root of 100 is 10, if I take the negative and throw it in there, I should get this out. But what happens when I take a negative times a negative? I get out positive 100, not working. I'm looking for a negative. My other option, if it's already positive, still going to be positive. So what about that radical? Am I actually allowed to take the square root of a negative? Is it possible? So we can't answer that question in this class. I mean, we can answer it, but we can't actually solve these because we need complex numbers, imaginary numbers. So radical expressions with negative radicands, that's super important. Underline that word with negative radicands, they don't represent real numbers. So later in math, we will encounter a number system called the complex numbers. Complex numbers, in which we actually define the square root of a negative. But in this case, in this class, we're not going to delve too deeply into that, we're just going to say this thing doesn't represent a real number. I can't evaluate it. So let's actually take a few of these radical expressions and determine if it represents a real number or not. Could we actually evaluate these in this class? So part A, I'm asking for the negative radicand of the square root of 25. Can I evaluate that? Yeah, it's going to represent a real number real number. But what about b if I put it on the inside of that radical now? So my radicand itself is negative. Not going to be a real number. Not real. It's going to be imaginary. For part c, I've got a negative on the outside, which is fine. I'm asking for the negative radical. But on the inside, my radicand is negative. So this is not going to be real. We can't evaluate that. But if I pull the negative just on the outside and keep my radicand positive, then yeah, this is going to be a real number. So we can have negatives on the outside. That's totally fine. We're asking for the negative radical in that case. But the radicand, the thing on the inside, needs to be positive. So we're going to look at a few examples, kind of to sum up this entire section. So this expression, the square root 
of x squared. It has a perfect square radicand on the inside. It can be a little bit confusing to simplify it, so we're going to work through an example. We're going to evaluate that radical when x is both 3 and negative 3 and see what comes out. So when x is 3, what does this expression turn into? The square root of 3 squared. And whenever I see x, again, I'm going to put parentheses around it so I know what my power is actually attached to. So 3 squared, what value does that give me? Positive 9. And I'm asking for the principal or the positive root of 9, which is what? What do I have to square to get me to 9? 3. But now let's plug in negative 3. So I'm looking at the square root of negative 3, that quantity, squared. So we need to evaluate the innermost first. So I've got negative 3 times negative 3, which gives me 9. And I'm asking again for the principal root, the positive root of 9 is 3. So regardless of what I was putting in, if it was positive or negative, I got out positive 3. So how can we label that relationship? If I put in a positive, I get out a positive. If I put in a negative number, I get out its opposite. I get out the positive version. So what kind of function produces positives only from either a positive or a negative? That relationship is the absolute value. So regardless of what I'm putting in, it always comes out to be positive because absolute value is talking about distance. So how far away from zero is three on that number line? Three units. How far away is negative three from zero? Three units just in a different direction. So for any real number A, the square root of that cap A squared is going to be what? The absolute value of whatever we're putting in. Because I can take that thing and square it and know my radicand is positive, regardless of what we're plugging in for A. So let's take a look at these few examples. We're going to assume that expressions underneath the radicals represent any real number. So we can plug in anything positive, negative, or zero, as long as it's real. So what are we going to get out in this case for A? If it's that form, I've got the square root of some quantity squared. So what's evaluated out? It's always going to be the absolute value of 10. And we can evaluate that farther because 10 is positive. Absolute value of a positive is just itself. So it's going to evaluate out to 10. But what about for part B? So again, I still fit that form. Looking at the absolute value of the inside. Absolute value of negative 7 is positive 7. Because again, when I square that negative, it turns into a positive, And we're still asking for the principal root. What about part C? In that case, my value on the inside is that expression 3x. And I have a little operation symbol in between here, multiplication, 3 times x. And what about 3? It's always positive, so I don't need him inside of the radicals, but I still need x to be inside of those absolute values. Why? I could plug in anything that I want for x, positive, negative, or 0. So I still need those absolute values to tell me Whatever we're plugging in here, we need to make it positive. Same story for part D. I need the absolute value of the thing on the inside. But does it fit that form exactly? Some quantity squared. I have two pieces individually that are being squared. So how could I rewrite it to fit that form? What quantity do I need to put on the inside to get out A squared, B squared? when I square it. I need to plug in an A and a B. So now it fits. And again, we take the absolute value of whatever quantity we're squaring on the inside. And can we remove the absolute value symbols here? No, because I can plug in whatever I want for A and B. 
question for part E. It doesn't fit that form of some quantity squared for my radicand, but can we force it to fit that form? So let's see. If I'm going to have some binomial squared, that would mean this thing has to be a perfect square trinomial. So does it fit? First thing is a perfect square. Last thing is a perfect square. They're both positive. And in the middle, I've got 2 times x times 1. So it is a perfect square. And how does it factor? x and 1, and what symbol, what sign do we have on the inside? Positive. So we can evaluate that out. I'm looking at the absolute value of whatever I'm plugging in, x plus 1. That quantity needs to be positive. So in many cases, it can be assumed that the radicands do not represent the square of a negative. So when that assumption is made, we don't have to worry about all of these absolute values anymore. So actually, take the next try, that very last thing, simplify them, but assume that the radicands do not represent the square of a negative. So don't worry about taking the absolute values anymore. We're assuming that it's going to be positive and nice. So when we make that assumption, the numbers that I'm plugging in for my variables are going to be nice, positive. Then we don't have to worry about these absolute values. So let's evaluate the first. We have that same example that we just completed, but now we're not worrying about um, the radicand becoming negative. So what do I need? I have the square root of some quantity squared. So they're undoing each other, and I'm just left with what's on the inside, 3x. And since we're assuming that x is a nice positive number, we don't need those absolute values anymore. So I get out 3x. And for part b, again, we have to rewrite our radicand as some quantity squared. What do we need? Same story over here. An a and a b. But we're assuming that a and b, whatever we plug in, they're nice and positive. So what do we get out? The principal root, or the positive root, of AB squared is AB. If I take that number and square it, I get the thing on the inside. And for part C, we need it to fit that form, some quantity squared. It is a perfect square trinomial of what? X and 2. And we're assuming that those numbers are nice and positive, so what do we get out? We're undoing our square with that radical, so we're just left with the insides. So henceforth, in this text, we will assume that no radicands are formed by raising a negative quantity to any kind of even power. So we don't need to talk about the absolute value, but in reality, this is what's happening behind it all.